Welcome to RH Vodcast. I'm Chris, and today we have the great pleasure of welcoming Katarina Ivarsson to RH Vodcasting. Uh, Katarina is a true visionary and rest- renowned expert in the world of design, having co authored several books and publications, including Building Folk Hammett with IoT and Play Play on how we play and socialize with mobile technology. Inspired by science fiction literature, including the likes of Dune, Katarina's imagination and curiosity have led her to become a designer. Also an advocate for design fiction, and she is the CEO of Already Tomorrow, which is an innovative product research and identity design consultancy. They have offices located in Hong Kong, Singapore and Stockholm. Katarina and her team at Already Tomorrow help businesses stay ahead of the curve in the face of changing consumer demands and worldwide uncertainty. She speaks five languages, she's a true global citizen, and she is a beacon of inspiration for anyone looking to explore the intersection of design, technology, and the future. Welcome, Katarina. Thank you so much. Uh, let's get started. Um, firstly, I'd like to ask you about your early life, uh, if that's okay. Um, you've mentioned that as a child, uh, your imagination was sparked by science fiction literature, um, which carried you through to your work as a designer today. Yeah. Perhaps you could speak about your earliest experiences, your family background, um, and how that influenced you. Um, I think my childhood, I have a twin brother, so I was never alone growing up. Uh, we always, I always had like this partner in crime um, and I still have running next to me and uh, and doing uh, crazy stuff and exploring different things to it uh, and I think that uh, you know we uh, this like the curiosity that you have uh, of like finding new things and playing and I mean I also grew up in Sweden right and Sweden is really about like allowing kids to play for a very long time uh, to it you start school at the you know seven years old or something like that and you don't have it this like lots of you know we didn't have much restrictions I guess um, and uh, I love to paint and you know I love to explore these things my brother was building stuff and uh, I think my parents really encouraged me to to just do that kind of things like paint uh, producing like build stuff uh, I got this like um, little corner uh, with like a sewing machine uh, like at a very early age for my dad uh, to it and they are like stitched stuff and I went and cut stuff from the house and you know I just made stuff all the time <laughs> amazing yeah um you mentioned uh, science fiction hmm? um is that something that you were keen on um at an early age or when did that sort of come in in terms of I think it's uh, you know it came in around uh, it was my dad introducing me to science fiction uh to it and uh so he, he had the, all this, like, books, you know, all these penguin books of, like, you know, crime novels. And, you know, when I had gone through all those stuff, he was like, okay, read this. You know, this is, you know, something else to it. Uh, and it was, you know, starting with, like, you know, Asimov uh, and reading this kind of, you know, really, you know, if you go from crime novel to Asimov, it's a quite big change, right, to it. Uh, but also how this kind of, you kind of, like, the word just grow you know, to it, and you, be, you feel like suddenly it's like space was, you know, it was full of worlds into it, right? Uh, and I think, <laughs> if you can say, I have a very, like, rich inner life, so I saw all these images, you know, when I was reading in front of me, right? And I think that thing that you, you know, the written world can capture and allowing you to think about and imagine things, that was like the, the strength in, for me in science fiction to like explore beyond the, the world we're living in, right, somehow. Um. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, your education at university. Mm. Um, You received your master's degree from Lund University Mm. in Sweden, Um, but your master's in design was from Hong Kong Polytechnic in Hong Kong. Can you just speak to us about the comparison, the cultural differences, and what sort of perspectives did you get um, from having that approach that was cross-cultural? Um, I, I started to study industrial design in Sweden at the Polytechnic University, also there, right to it. And I think something that you learn in Sweden is like we have a very like, you know, a good design process. Uh, you get taught with bread, you know, the science process as part of the, your early start in that education to it. 
uh, you are very hands-on still. You, there's always a workshop to go to and build the things you're doing. So there is, it is this kind of hands-on process-based thing of like learning a really, really good process to it. But one of the things that I experienced early was that also it's was also re- really have this established, you know, we're really good at design in Sweden. Uh, Scandinavian design is something, you know, well established to it. I went from there to study in Italy and it was the same thing there, you know, like design, you know, we're so good at design, design is, you know, and it was well established. And I think was what took me to in the interest in Hong Kong was this kind of um, looking at design in a different way. And not looking at it as just something of like, you know, making nice furniture or uh, making nice products. But it was really also about like using design as a business tool, right? And I think that's also why I really like to come to Hong Kong to explore that. Mm. And I think one of the things that I brought with me, you know, from Sweden was this like my really solid knowledge of like a really good design process. My also knowledge of making things. But what I didn't have was, the, you know, the, the commercial side of it, you know, how you, how you sell a product within an organization, how you work with financial goals into it. And that's was something that I learned here when I was studying here, right? So it was like two words coming together, like of which you need both to do great design to it. Mm. Um, and I think that part of like being able to have a really good process, knowing how the hands-on process to make it, and then also being able to learn, you know, the commercial process of it and how you make it happen within a company. I think that was the biggest, you know, uh, the biggest strength, strength and also like the biggest difference between them, right, Ted? Do you think you could talk a little bit about what it takes to encourage the next generation of learners, of students, um, to become great innovators, to become great creators in their own right? What did you see from your education um, that perhaps could be applied or improved upon um, in terms of, you know, directives for the next generation? I think it starts very early. Uh, I think it's lo- it's really starts from, like, allowing kids to be kids and allowing them to play. And then that we continue to play. You know, we don't stop playing because we start school. And we right. don't, don't stop exploring because... Uh, we we start school uh, and I think right now the education system here in Hong Kong is um, is a bit too rigid for kids because kids needs more freedom uh, and I think that's also part of this you know education we've seen in Sweden that we have a lot of freedom as young kids to explore to trust ourselves to discover things uh, and I think that curiosity is like key to innovation. And also the fearlessness of daring to do things and daring to fail on the way of doing so. And you can only learn that if you, you know, you play and you try. And that's, that's something that I think should be continued, you know, more. Uh, you know, not only when, when we talk about, you know, kids, you talk about sensory play. But that sensory play, we should continue that throughout. We should never stop playing with things. And that's also what we try to do now, that you, when you go into and explore technology like do it with like play do it with a sense of curiosity do it with like you know a, a feeling of you know you know you know i don't know what i'm going to discover i'm just you know see what's going to happen right to it and i think that kind of uh, the play the curiosity and also uh, allowing people to explore and that's really about building you know a, a solid enough like scaffolding to guide right to it but not a framework that you need to follow and like, you know, form yourself into. Sure. Um, Leaving sort of tertiary education, um, you've talked about having the business influence to your, to your education and and wanting to move out to Hong Kong to sort of be able to apply these design principles in the field of business. You started working with Lerado um, in 2006, 2007. Um, and as a design, a lead designer there, uh, you work closely with factories in China and Taiwan. Can you comment a little bit on what those first experiences were like, the insights you gained there, um, and what you learned about sort of building these types of relationships in product development? I think, um, you know, working and living at a factory is like the best school any product designer can go through. <laughs> Because it's hardcore and it's painful and it's like hilarious and it's amazing and you learn so many stuff. Uh, I also came in at an era where, you know, these um, Chinese and Taiwanese manufacturers were starting to bring in their designers on, the, uh, on their own and have international designers working with them. Uh, so it was something new for them. It was something new for me. 
but it was definitely, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, yeah, I think all of us learned a lot when we were there, right, to it. Uh, but basically, uh, this whole thing also how like, the responsibility that I was given uh, as a designer, I had, I had 40 different accounts uh, wow. of clients that I was supposed to handle when I first came in. And for me, being a new designer, I thought that was normal, right? But I also realized when I started to work in other agency that, you know, okay, managing 40 accounts on your own and designing for them, that is like, you know, then you're doing a lot to it. Uh, but I also learned the whole kind of cycles of, you know, we had the R&D was based in Taiwan. Uh, so I went to the R&D office there and worked for two weeks. And then I would go to China and worked with the sample team and the manufacturing there. So I could really learn the whole cycle. Um, and we also had, you know, every year at the Toy Fair, we had the clients coming from Europe and US and you would meet them in the factory in China and go through the lines for the coming year to it. So it was this really, it was really, really hands-on way of learning how a production manu manufacturing cycle looks like to it. Sure. Um, after, you know, several positions afterwards, um, you uh, started Boris Design Studio. Um, I'd like to ask you about the experience of launching that. Um, you were um, two women, yourself and Anna Carlson. Mm. Um, that in itself um, is, you know, unusual um, to start that out. But you were also unique in that you were starting essentially a Swedish company that was established in, in Hong Kong without actually having a, a base office in Sweden. Um, can you speak a little to those early experiences and what your mentality was like sort of starting off in that industry as, as a business leader? Mm. We were obviously completely fearless, uh, young, <laughs> and uh, just dare to do anything. And I think the the hours I've been, uh, you know, spent on buses through like the Pearl River Delta to go to factories together with Anna to discover a new factory with, you know, for a client or for our own products. And we would spent so many hours on doing that. And we also did it without any kind of fear into this right to it. We also, it was the same thing setting up a company right to it. Okay, like, let's just set up a company. We're going to try this out. Um, and I think uh, part of it was also that we, we kind of had this, um, we've tried out working here, both of us. Uh, and we also, it was also like in the, around the financial crisis, 2008, the opportunities in Europe were not that great, but we could still see that, you know, Hong Kong and Asia was bouncing back and we like to end this opportunity to do this. Um, so I think the, the experience was like, you know, that if you, if you do this, like, again, with this beginner's mind, that you don't have the expectation of it that it's going to be difficult and that you're going to have a lot of, like, administrations and things to follow up on, uh, and you just do it. The fearlessness in that, I think, is one of these, like, just, you know, just go to it. Uh, and I think we've, I mean, we also, uh, we were also this unique, as you say, we were two women, industrial designers, in product design to it. And I think that, you know, that we were like, we set off like doing that made us quite unique. So it was quite easy for us to go into companies because they were also curious about who we were and mm -hmm. who we dared to like come in and just like have this company to it um, and working with something as hardcore as like tech and products. In terms of gender representation in industrial design, since you stepped into the industry as an entrepreneur, have you seen any progression? Not as much as I would hope for. Um, I think when you look into the universities, uh, there is like you know, a fifty-fifty of like women and men studying to it. But when you start looking at how people like, especially working out here and work close to manufacturing and those parts, it is mostly men to it. Um, that might be due to you know like you know, some fear holding you know, holding women back to going out there and do this kind of thing uh, to it. But I think it's also maybe in the expectations of who a product designer is right to it. Sure. Can you talk about um, how you managed to foster uh, the right work culture for your team across geographies from one side of the world to the other as a leader um, of creatives what sort of values did you sort of espouse, did you direct in order to sort of get the most out of your teams? I think um, both me and Anna are very like, um, 
we're like hard workers, you know. We work and we produce a lot of by ourselves. Uh, so I think it's also like, you know, showing by doing to our team that we, you know, we all dig in, we all produce stuff, we all take part in, you know, anything if it's like, you know, financial sheets uh, to uh, looking at drawings or, you know, carrying stuff of heavy bags back and from workshops or like, you know, samples into China. Uh, but I think one of the important part about building our team is really finding this like diversity of thought and bringing in different people. Mm. people who match the team and also match the team in the sense that they bring in something new to the team. And I think that is really key because uh, when we do that, we start to see things differently. Uh, not always easy, but we start to see things in a bigger way. You know, it's, it's a little bit like reading science fiction. You know, you start seeing the world differently. <laughs> to it. And that's it. And mm. not only in terms of cultural diversity, but one of the things that you speak about a lot is div design diversity. Mm. Um, what do you look for when you're bringing somebody in in terms of the design diversity that they can add to a team? What sort of characteristics or values do you look for in a hire which makes you think, yeah, that's somebody that could work for me? Um, I think it's uh, part of it is, of course, the skills, you know, design skills that you have and the education background you have. But uh, part of it, is it can also be, you know, um, you know, where you've been before uh, to it. If you've uh, you've worked in, you know, have you worked anywhere else in Asia? Have you worked in China? Have you worked in Japan? Have you worked with, like, startups uh, in, in Africa? Have you worked with women, uh, you know, collectives uh, in in Romania? Have you, have you, where, what, what have you worked with that can bring in this kind of different perspective and also build on the values that we have, right, of, um, uh, but yeah, playfulness, diversity, and also, like, you know, <laughs> the human focus uh, is going to it, right? Sure. Um, you've just launched um, Already Tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, you know, congratulations on that, uh, which you're the CEO of. Um, can you um, speak a little bit to how Already Tomorrow wants to differentiate, how it wants to stand and present itself with a, present a unique sort of value proposition to the market? I think the uniqueness is one part of it, but I also think what we really want to bring is some value to it. And we also really want to build on our passions. Uh, and that's, again, you know, like, uh, like we talked about, the, you learn from, you know, yesterday, you play with the day and you design for tomorrow. Because we already live, you know, in the future. We're already part of it. So we really need to, to make sure we make products that, you know, makes a difference for the future. Mm. Uh, we talk a lot about like uh, the future is human and what we mean with that is really that there are human characteristics you know emotional intelligence and creativity that is super important that we carry as humans uh, that AI at least right now <laughs> do not carry <laughs> and to be able to bring that in and join that together with you know the new tools that come up AI tools or something like that that's really when we can design products for tomorrow right for the future, uh, that, you know, carry value to it. Uh, so I think it's it's really about um, the uniqueness, or if we should say the way, like, we want to carry value, is uh, really exploring to play, to create validation and create good products to it. And that could be services also, but products that make sense to people and that people see as useful in their lives. I want to um, ask you about manufacturing. Um, you talk about being hands-on in the manufacturing process. Can you explain to us um, what that looks like in practice uh, to a generalist? Uh, does it mean being on the factory floor necessarily? Um, what does being hands-on mean as a designer? Uh, for me, when we started off, and I, I would say still, it really means being on the factory floor. And it means being super like hands-on with things. Um, back in the days, me and Anna, dis we uh, designed a fire emergency product for decontamination in, uh, you know, big accidents of, um, uh, let's say like it's a big leak of a, some 
know, dangerous substance to it, and then you need to clean people off very quickly. So mm. it's a tent unit that you, the fire emergency service, use. Uh, and we found this factory to build it, and we really did a lot of the testing ourselves, which meant like when they had a <laughs> prototype ready, we came there and we would throw it down the stairs. <laughs> <to> <laughs> And they would be like, what are you doing? And, you know, so that's like we, we, that's like one way of being hands on, like really making sure you're like, you're there, you try it out, add the floor right to it. But it's also being part of knowing, I mean, like today, for example, um, being hands on that, you know, you find a manufacturer online, uh, you see them, they seem to make a perfect fit. They give you a good price to it. You start like getting some samples received and then those might be treated, you know, printed and so on to it. But then knowing, you know, when you actually put money into production that that factory actually exists. Right. That's one very hands-on way of doing, you know. So just meeting, you know, a person uh, in real life, in, it could be one part of this being hands-on to it. Or it could be being very hands-on in development of a new product where you go there and you set up this, I don't like the word, the war room, but like a focus room uh, with the client and you have this full on design process to meet regulations of the new product and you do that over three days because you work with the product management team at the factory, you have the engineers coming in, you have the, you know, the tech developers coming in and you can iterate really quickly by being there and guiding the process to it. So you guide a creative process. I see. Uh, so being hands-on, I think uh, it makes a lot of difference to it. In these days, you are looking also at the future of manufacturing. We are going into like the you know the rapid prototyping and the printing on demand things. So I think we'll see a change into it, right? Of what that is to it, but we will still, for big uh, traditional manufacturing of products on like a larger scale. I think the hands on and at least, you know, have some ice there, right? It's very important to it. Well, that's it because, yeah. you, you know, we increasingly see examples such as 3D printing um, and it would seem to me that some design firms might think that they can get away with being based in Europe and the US, having the manufacturing in Asia and as long as the instructions are correct. But what you're saying is that what actually happens in practice is iteration on the ground. So, so actually, <laughs> a lot can go wrong unless you're really providing a very you know, close eye. Sometimes, uh, we I say like, if people know how difficult it would be to produce something, no one would produce anything. Wow. <laughs> you know, it, that's a little taking a bit too far. But there are always things that can go wrong, right? In terms of timelines, uh, in terms of, you know, you know, the regulations where a factory can fulfill, uh, and also in terms of, uh, you know if a factory will have the capacity when you need the ca them to have capacity to it. So I think there's a lot of these negotiations that I do find being very valuable to do in um, uh, doing person. And I think being on location uh, when you do this, it's really about like securing the design investment and also making sure that you can, you know, save time in the process to it. You've talked about the um, Hong Kong being a strategic location because it's close to the manufacturing. Is that going to be the case for the next 10, 20 years? Um, you've obviously got good, great supply chain connections in manufacturing across Southeast Asia, but is it all about mainland China or do you see other geographies in Southeast Asia that you see being promising? And what might that mean for Hong Kong? I think um, when you look at manufacturing right now, we are going through a change. And that change has come partly with the pandemic and with China being closed down, but partly also with the will of people wanting to different their market of production to it. Uh, China, and especially, you know, what we have across the border uh, to it with the, uh, you know, Greater Bay Area or like the Pearl River Delta was classically called, we have like a very, very, you know, like high-end manufacturing, uh, also in terms of knowledge, technology, and where it's, you know, and that knowledge is difficult to compete with. That's not saying that we don't, we're not starting to see that in other places. Um, mm. We have people that we work with also moving, uh, you know, production to, uh, let's say, Vietnam or the Philippines or India to it. So you can see these kind of type of uh, manufacturing, you know, places that people are selecting them as well to diversify a little bit. 
but you still see a lot of people, you know, remaining in China as it is for now. And that's also because that the know know how and the knowledge of these high end production is still, you know, it's you know, somebody said the new China is China, right? <laughs> because it's still there. To it. the knowledge is still there right to it. So until we find like really good ways of also you know, transferring that knowledge or sh- building up that knowledge in other places. And that might be with like 3D printing and rapid prototyping and rapid production and those parts about it. But I think uh, China is, is still, you know, st- is still in the game right to it. And we should also remember that a lot of these manufacturers in other places are also sh- still Chinese owned right to it when they go in and other that's places fair. to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's move on to <laughs> the subject of, of design fiction, um, which, you know, you're obviously very well read in um i'd like to ask you to to describe um what makes a great team in the design fiction sphere um how does the diversity of thought mix um work best how would you assemble a team uh, when you wanted to pull off a great design fiction project so the same fiction, you know, where you where you put yourself, you know, in the future, like if it's ten or twenty or thirty years from now, uh, and you imagine, you know, a plausible possible future for a product or for, uh, you know, a company or like a city, whatever it could be, or a country. Uh, you really need that kind of again this diversity of thought, right? You need um, so for, from our side, we usually bring together. Uh, you know, academics, uh, people who research on these specific topics into it. Uh, they could be other experts, uh, people who's been writing books about it, or people that work in in key ind- key you know companies and industries around it. Um, it can also be you know artists. Uh, it can be musicians. If if it, that would be something bringing in that we need to share something through art and culture, uh, and of course designers of different you know. Uh, skill sets and then we also try to bring in you know producers to it in terms of maybe uh, like say journalists to it or videographers into it to make sure that you know when we we do this setting because what we do is like really like we're putting ourselves in the future right and we're creating this scenario of the future right Mm. and we to make that scenario we gather a lot of intel and a lot of expertise that we you know put together into this like some of them being you know, things like, okay, we see these policies going into place, uh, where other things might be speculations, you know, going into it, right? And when we put those the whole thing together, we also need some, you know, if we bring in an expert like a journalist, he can send, you know, an interview one person uh, as if, you know, <laughs> as it was already tomorrow in, you know, 20, 2040, uh, yeah. part about it. So we get really good content around it also to it, uh, and believable content that makes it feel real. One thing that's unique about um, how you how you think about collaboration in design fiction is that you try to bring in um, research institutes. Mm. Um, you've commented that clients, big clients, um, even you know big conglomerates, can actually be quite isolated in their thinking. Um, can you comment on um, how you try to work with research institutes and the effectiveness that 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 they bring to clients? There is a big difference between companies and research institute, right, to it, because uh, companies, they want to have something ready. They want to, you know, get something very tangible out of it that, you know, is packed and ready to it, right? Whereas in research, you're always working on a research, you know, ID or a way and it's an iteration. So this thing about in research is about being finished with something and ready it's just like one it's just one iteration that can be reworked on right uh so I, m- me when these two meet there can always be there can be a little bit you know clash right and i think also when we started working with research and we're like okay this is what we did right? so this is like how we illustrated this and it's like yeah but you know this is this is not fin- finalized right to it so f- it's very important to present things as uh, iterations um, but what i do think uh, this really important part about um, working with research institutes and also with think tanks is that when you bring researchers and you bring, um, you know, the commercial corporate world together, you bring different expertise together. And 
again, researchers, uh, they are working on things of the future, right? Because they are, you know, they are looking at things that we don't really have yet to it. Mm. And bringing that mindset together with uh, corporates and seeing the possibilities there and pushing, you know, what we can do, going away from like what we have today to something that is, you know, of tomorrow or the future. That is really like where the strong point is right too. And that's like when we worked with a research institution, for example, in Sweden, we work with the big Swedish companies right to it and they're being part of this uh research consortium and seeing, you know, like how like really early strange ideas that we worked with 10 years ago and we start seeing them being commercialized now because we are very far ahead when we work with research institutes, right? We're not, it's not something that will come out, you know, in one or two years, right? It is a 10 year perspective, right, to it. I wanted to ask you, when we talk about design fiction, hmm? um, future focused design, yeah. imagining new futures, what is the reaction that you get from ROI focused clients um, when they take into account project costs, um, restrictions, bureaucracy? How are you able to sell clients on the importance of this aspect? Uh, I would say like selling um, design fiction, but when you go higher up and you work on a C level and um, people also it's really bad like you know, you've done your purpose and you've done your mission, you know, but what's what's the visions that you have for the company like? How are you going to build for the future? And that's really where, where I see where people, you know, start to understand the value of it because it's really about like, it's not, you know, about the product we have today. It's really like, how will we survive? You know, what, what will we be right. 10, 20, 30 years from now to it? And I think at a, like a higher management level, you also have that like perspective, so one of the design fiction work, we work with the, the city of Stockholm. Uh, and it was the uh, one of the um, managers, and he was in, in part of managing, you know, the tech IT structure from Stockholm, right? To it. And they were like, yeah, you know, Stockholm want to be the smartest city in the world, 2040. You're like, okay, <laughs> to it. And he's like, okay, but, you know, yeah, I need to be able to share this story with someone, right, to it. And he saw one of the products we work with, and he's like, okay, this is a way for me to tell the story, to engage broader than just around the IT team, to you know, engage the whole city. Because if they start seeing the vision we have, they can also start questioning the vision, and they can bring their ideas to it, and we can start a dialogue of how we get to become the smartest city in the world. And that's really what it is. So the design fiction, the scenario or the artifact or like the prototype, the future product that you build, it's not really the result itself, right? It's really about that dialogue that you start and discussion you start of like, okay, who do yeah. we want to be? Who do we get there? What do we need to change? Or like, what did we like scrap, you know? Or what did we build on to it to get here? One of the things that you mentioned in a previous interview was that you found that in Asian business culture, clients tend to be faster to act on projects, to start projects, to say, let's go. Um, does this also apply to sort of future fo focused design fiction projects? Or do you find that in design fiction, you actually get more traction in Europe rather than Asia? How does that compare? I think people who want to look at the future they are all usually quite the same speed of like wanting to start a product on it. Mm. I think traditionally we worked with a lot of um, the bigger clients, you know, in Sweden around design fiction. Uh, and I think since we have, we, we have that legacy of working with this one, so it's, you know, quite easy to continue selling on that legacy among those companies to it. But I would say it's the same thing here because here is also you see this kind of disruption and transformation and change going on so quick here. So at some point when a lot of clients will ask themselves, right, okay, where where are we going to it? And then again, you know, the willingness to do a project will come fast again, right, to it, so. Sure. I'd like to ask you about your movement between countries. Um, you obviously first opened your office in Hong Kong and uh, Stockholm came afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to me about the value of the Stockholm sort of location? Um, 
it does it have is there a certain pr marketing element to it an identity element to it why not choose another big population center a london and new york um what what was the thinking about where you position your offices it definitely has part of the identity because uh, i am you know i am swedish and i swedish um so uh, the swedishness also like is is a big part of who we are and i think in the swedishness really comes this like focus on innovation that we have and the culture of innovation uh, and the culture of focusing on innovation that we have in sweden is i think is crucial you know i mean sweden is just a country of like 10 million people yet we're known across the world for innovations right to it yeah. and there's something to that uh, so I think the way of, uh, you know, how education is structured, uh, that is free for people, uh, that also the government puts a lot of money into uh, innovation and the strategic, you know, innovation to it. Uh, and that there we have all these, you know, universities pushing these interesting ideas, lots of researchers. And we have these big companies also that also puts back into the research right to it. So I think for us, it's definitely a part of our identity as being Swedish, but it's also the strength of like the the Swedish innovation, right, to it, the the Swedish innovation phenomenon, like uh, to it that we were very proud of. Fantastic. Um, let's look forward a little bit. Um, already tomorrow um, has already hosted uh, two editions of its um, very popular blockchain party events, mm-hmm. uh, where you bring the you know creative community together. Um, I'd like to to ask you a little bit about how you structure those, um, how you try to put your values of play into those into those events. Um, so when you come from world of tech and you work with that almost on a daily basis, right? And also, and that's what you see. You'll see that on you know, like in the feed, LinkedIn feed, right? It's AI everywhere. You will talk with clients about it and. Uh, we also, you know, we try it out in the office, everything that comes new and we sit and play with it, right? So it's easy to believe, again, because you're in this, like, where you are, to believe that that's something everybody does right to it. Uh, but then uh, we also started seeing that people maybe do not have access to it, they don't maybe don't have t- direct time and to engage into it. So we really w- wanted to start up, like, being able to start as, like, opportunities for one, bringing community together, and knowledge sharing and for people to play with technology. And we thought about like the best way to do that and we like block party. Yes, block party, blockchain party, play with words to it. And we got this concept together and we it's quite a simple setup that we do uh, because we, we, we invite people who and you know, friends and companies that we know to showcase their specific tech if they have it. We have a few computers. Uh, and uh, we have like, you know, it's peer-to-peer education, more or less right into it. Like, how does this, you know, chat book like work? Like, how do you write a prompt? Like, how do you create an image in the mid-journey? Like, what is NFT art really about, right, to it? And like, how does an AI, you know, DJ work to it? And so it's really like bringing these things together and playing with it. And also, again, the dialogue and discussions that you have right to it about like, you know, if you sit and ask all your questions and all the questions will be asked by, you know, an AI, you know, that doesn't have any, you know, emotions, right, too. Will we become, like, emotionless? Will we start reacting with emotions? Um, stop, like, reacting with emotions because we don't get fed emotions to it? And those kind of discussions are the things that comes up when mm-hmm. we have these kind of, uh, you know, fun, you know, blockchain parties. Uh, but it's really having, like, philosophical discussions about, like, where we stand, you know, humans, AI, <laughs> tech, and the world to it, right? How do you envision envision blockchain and AI tying into your work going forward? Oh. <clears throat> Obviously, if you've been anywhere on LinkedIn these days, it's going to affect everything. It's going to steal your jobs and do this and that right to it. Uh, but I, I do think, um, I think someone talked about this also. Um, might have been my husband actually to it, right? Uh, who's also a designer. Uh, and he talked about like this kind of, you know, when we talk about AI and we talk about like AI you know, taking our jobs. It's not really about that. It's just like AI will, it's really about changing our, like the way we work as a designer. Uh, and as a designer or creative, you can see yourself like, you know, like a, a content producer because you 
you you produce content right to it. But what AI will uh, turn us into is like content uh, you know curators instead, because the content will come from someone else, but it will still need a like, curation of it uh, to make it you know make it align again with the validation, the human needs, and the sense making of it. Um, and so I th and I think that looking at us like you know as you know content or creative curators with AI like as a support, it's you know it's a quite nice way to look at it and um, you know also like a hopeful way to look at it a lot has a lot has changed since um the decade that's passed since you published play play um a book which comprises experiences from researchers working on mobile technology for play and leisure um back as far as 2007 more than 10 years later how do you feel that reality has turned out compared to the expectations that you saw when compiling that book. Um, and, you know, you referred to, to that work, or it, it was commonly referred to as a time capsule. So do you feel that it has stood the test of time? It definitely has stood the test uh, like of time. Uh, and its purpose as a time capsule also shows, again, this like where research really is right to it. Uh, when we published our book, um, it was uh, a lot of researchers and people working in this kind of also um, in these research groups uh, and you know the universities and connected to it. For them, this was like, oh, they work in those things. Yeah, that's interesting to it. But for people outside that sphere, it was like, I have no one idea what this is. You know? <laughs> What's immersive gaming, right, to it? And how are we going to be able to, like, share pictures of a phone and, like, you know, create stories, direct stories, like cartoons of ourselves? And it was, like, all these kind of strange things. Are we going to, like, why are kids going to draw on a table in, in one school and then the other school would see it? And what's the value in this one to it? And, and it was a lot of things that, you know, was a bit strange. <coughs> but where you look at it now, it's like, ah, oh, yeah no, that's not strange, and oh yeah, I see that one, I see that one. So you see bits and pieces like that was discovered in this research, and what was interesting with this research that was that we worked with approximately 40 researchers mm. um, working in different research institutes, and they have a lot of like papers that they present their research in right to it, but it's usually, you know, it's a white paper, right? You need to read a lot to get through what they're meaning. And what we did was, you know, looking at the papers, reading it, and then making it tangible by creating illustrations or creating stories or just explaining it like in in one page more or less right to yeah. it. Yeah. I'd like to move on to some of the values um, that are close to your heart. Um, firstly, sustainability. Um, on one hand, you, uh, you concede that sustainable products are more expensive for the consumer, expensive to produce. Um, but at the other end of the scale, um, you know, you're not keen on concepts such as eco-luxury. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of clear that up a little bit um, and, and sort of just sort of lay out to us where the middle ground is and, and where the ideal path is in your view. I think a few years I said in a, in a podcast something about I beep hate Eco luxury <laughs> to it, and what I meant with that is that um, eco friendly sustainability shouldn't be something that just you know available for the few. It's something that should be available for like you know people in general to it. And if you make it a luxury uh, to be like eco conscious and sustainable, it's not approachable for everyone to it. Uh, also, when I made that statement, it was approximately what was that? 13, 14 years ago, maybe, uh, we were also in a way where it was much more expensive to produce like sustainable products right to it. Where we are today, uh, I mean, yes, if you, you can choose to order, you know, a product in China that costs nothing, that has no regulations around it, it's getting more difficult because the regulations, sustainable regulations in China is also getting better right to it. Uh, but when you... When you do that, you know, um, I think it is it is easier. It's not super easy, but it's easier to produce sustainable products these days to it. 
and it still should be the choice for you to do it right to it and you can do that it doesn't have to be that it's made of ocean plastic right it could be that it like use one less coating on it uh, it could also be like you know if it's more a digital service that you're creating you know like how much you know what is it that you're actually creating does it does it give you any value does it is it like is it meaningful uh, and also, uh, I mean, those part is also part of the whole thing. Like sustainability is not only about the, the material, the production about it, but it's also like the longevity of the product that you're doing right to it. You've mm. also mentioned that you feel that sus sustainability and improvements in that area are kind of beyond um, the efforts of the everyday consumer and that we need to move up the value chain towards the manufacturers towards the decision makers to, to really have an effect on sustainability. You're obviously based in Hong Kong, which is geographically closer to the man manufacturers. Do you feel that being based here, as opposed to being based, say, in Europe or Sweden, gives you more of a platform, more of an opportunity to affect change in sustainability? I would say I hope it does. Uh, I'm not sure... Um I can have that massive impact uh, to it as one person. Uh, but I do think that um, the awareness among designers uh, and the care also in terms of manufacturers uh, through the years since I came to Hong Kong has definitely increased. And it is like part of like a hygiene value these days uh, to, to actually care about sustainability, to care about like good processes in manufacturing to it. Uh, so... I do think that my generation as designers has been part in like, you know, pushing that to it uh, because it was something that we all became aware of uh, to it. And by us becoming aware, we have more have made more people aware. And these days it's something, you know, that's really part of design education and it's part of, you know, the policies also with manufacturers. And we can see countries ma making changes on it as well, right, to it. Um, about a month and a half ago, you attended a panel on how blockchain technology mm. can potentially be used to drive improvements in sustainability. Um, what are some of the thoughts that you have on that? What are some of the takeaways that you had in terms of realistic applications for blockchain to, um, to, to drive change in sustainability? I think for blockchain is really about accountability uh, and also, yeah, and traceability to it. And I think that's the key, uh, like when it comes to sustainability and production uh, for blockchain to it. So it's, it's, you know, it's quite hands on the easy way again, right to it, you know. Blockchain smart contracts uh, can support sustainable processes and support sustainable policies to be held and kept to, to promise right to it. Uh, to see it in a very easy way right to it. But then I also think that uh, looking at this is can be very easy that these kind of emerging technologies become separated from sustainability, but technology and tech is really part, it's materials you can use, you know, to make the world better, but if you apply them in the right way. Sure. So, um, Katharina, two years ago, you were appointed as vice chair of the board of directors of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Um, can you comment on um, that platform and um, you know what what it does in in what it provides in Hong Kong. So for me, um, you know, knowledge sharing uh, is key to it, and that's what that uh, you know bringing people together. If that's a blockchain party, or that's you know a chamber of commerce, or that's you know going and teach uh, you know at the design school. But knowledge sharing is super important uh, because it then it's also again like different perspectives uh, sharing. Your experience is knowing what you can do better or easier or avoid problems or, you know, make something super easy for yourself right to it. Sure. Um, so knowledge sharing is like key for me in this one. And that's also what I'm, I'm so passionate about that. So I really love being part of the, the Chamber of Commerce. But it also provides us a platform to influence policies uh, into it uh, in sustainability or in tech uh, and innovation and or tax regulation, company regulations to it. Uh, so it's a really good forum to, you know, bring people together and also bring focus to questions that are important. You're obviously in the Tech and Innovation Committee. 
uh, within the Chamber of Commerce. Um, can you speak to what that role involves and what you hope to achieve? Um, that's going back again to um, you know the Swedish uh, innovation phenomenon to it. We do have lots of uh, companies, famous uh, across the you know globe, uh, Swedish companies to it, and uh, I think it also gives us an opportunity to talk about innovation, to talk about the need for openness and for people to being able to share and for people to transfer information. Uh, and also spread this kind of Swedish values that are important to it. Um, and I think that's, um, because for me, it's like openness and sharing of information is also part of this, together with play then, is things that are key to innovation, right, to it. Uh, and for me to be able to do that through the Tech and Innovation Committee, together with our members, and sharing our knowledge about these Swedish companies, but also bringing in, you know, perspective from Hong Kong companies to it and creating this platform uh, to, you know, share that success and build more success uh, around it. Uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, it's uh, very rewarding. Fantastic. Um, Katarina, a, um, a very informative interview. Um, we look forward to following your progress uh, with Already Tomorrow and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you very much for your time. And thanks again, Katerina Iversen. Thank you so much for having me. Of course.